Hey, I'm Jake Bartlett, and in this short video, I'm gonna teach you how masks work in Photoshop and Illustrator. Masks are powerful, and in a few minutes, you'll be able to use them in your work. Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator are used on just about every motion design project ever, so you need to have a good grasp on how they work. In Photoshop and Illustrator Unleashed, I teach you the ins and outs of both programs from a motion designer's perspective, so check that out if you really want to improve your skills. Also, you can download the project files I'm using in this video to follow along or practice this after you're done watching. The details are in the description. So what exactly is a mask? Well, it's really just a technique for containing a part of an image or hiding part of an image. In Illustrator, it's called a clipping mask, and I'm gonna show you how that works really quickly. Let's say that I wanna have this texture contained within this circle. I'll move this squiggly line group over top of the circle. Obviously, it's going outside of it, but if I bring this circle on top of the lines in the layer hierarchy, so I'll just click and drag that circle above it, select both objects, come up to Object, all the way down to Clipping Mask, and click on Make, there you go, that's all there is to it. The squiggly lines are now contained within that shape. But let's say that I wanted to keep that original gray color of the circle and not just have the squiggly lines in the shape of the circle. Well, I'll just undo that, and a really easy way of doing this is using what's called the draw inside mode inside of Illustrator. And I feel like this is a really little known feature of Illustrator. If you're not seeing these three little squares down here, it's probably because your toolbar is collapsed. So make sure that that's expanded so you can see these nice and clearly. But what we need to do is first just cut the squiggly lines. So I'll select them, press Command or Control X to cut and put them into the clipboard. Then I'll select that circle, go to this third option, draw inside. We have this new shaped bounding box letting us know that we're in that new drawing mode. And then I'll just paste in place by pressing Command Shift V or Control Shift V on a PC. Now if I click off of this, you'll see that those squiggly lines are contained within the circle, but the circle styling is preserved. If we look at the layers palette, we have a clip group. If I expand that out, we have the two objects, the ellipse with the underline under it, letting us know that's the object being used as the clipping mask. And then we have the squiggles group. From here, I can do whatever I want. I could select just those squiggles and rotate them. I could scale them up or down, change their colors. And once I'm happy with it, I just wanna make sure that I go back to draw normal to the standard mode, click off of it, and there we go. So let's take a look at our second example real quick and see how we could use this technique in the real world. This is a file that you can download and follow along with me. Just follow the link in the description of the video. So let's say that I wanna add some stylized glare to this Lamborghini graphic, and I'll do that using just straight lines. So let me zoom in nice and close, and we're gonna use that same draw inside technique. So I'll first select that windshield, then go into the draw inside mode, and then grab my line tool, get rid of my fill by clicking on this little none icon, switch to my stroke color and make this nice and bright. We'll just get a kind of off white color here for the glare and start drawing some lines. So I'll just do one maybe right about here. I'm just gonna bump up the stroke size to say 25. And then with my selection tool inside of this draw inside side mode, I can even duplicate this object by holding option or alt clicking and dragging, and then let's say make that one 15 points instead of 25, and then one more time duplicate it and make it say four points, okay? So there's my little stylized glare. I'll exit out of this draw inside mode, and there we go, we've got those stylized lines. If I don't like the way that they're positioned, I can just double click on one of them to get into isolation mode, so I'm not editing anything else. And then I'll just select those three, kind of reposition them, maybe change the angle a little bit, and there we go, I'll double click outside to get out of isolation mode. We've got some nice stylized glare reflections. Clipping masks are as simple as that. But there's one other type of mask inside of Illustrator called an opacity mask. And for this, I'm going to need a photo to use as the mask. So I'm gonna actually lock my car layer, unlock my background, and then expand that out. So I wanna bring in my image by coming up to File, Place, and there's this texture JPEG image, and it's just a black and white grungy texture photo. I'll click on place, and then click where I want the top left corner of the image to be placed, and there we go, we've got our image inside. So let's say I wanna use this image as a texture for the background of this graphic, but I wanna be able to control the color of it. I don't want it to just make the background darker. 
Well, an opacity mask is perfect for this kind of application. What I'll do first is just hide that layer and I wanna duplicate this background rectangle. So hold Option or Alt, click and drag up just below that photo. And now I have a different rectangle. I'm gonna make this a little bit brighter just so we can distinguish between this color and the background color. Next, I want to turn that photo back on and with it selected, I'll cut just like we did with the squiggly lines, Command or Control X. Then I'll select this new rectangle, go to my properties panel and into the opacity section. This little square right here is what I'm concerned with. It has a no sign on it, but this is where the opacity mask lives. If I double click, like it says, to create an opacity mask, it turns black and my rectangle disappears. And that's because in an opacity mask, black pixels equals 100% transparency or invisibility. It's 100% see-through. And white pixels are 100% opaque or solid and everything else in between white and black is semi-transparent pixels. So because there's nothing in my mask, it is black and I don't see any part of my image. But remember, I had cut that photo from before. So as long as I go to my layers, make sure I'm on that opacity mask and I paste, my photo is now pasted inside of this opacity mask. If I go back to my properties into the opacity panel, you can see in the thumbnail of this mask, there's my texture, and that is being used to shape the opacity of this layer. And if I go back to my normal editing mode by clicking on this square right here, I could go crazy. You know, this is our purple color, but I could change this to anything I want, and it's going to update. So it's using that texture as opacity information, not as color information, which is really great. But this is a really strong looking texture. It's covering up most of our background. If I go back into the opacity panel and look at that mask, you can see that most of it is white, and that's why we're seeing so much of the image that we're masking off. But if we click on the invert mask, that's literally just gonna swap the white and black pixels. So now the majority of the image is being hidden rather than shown, and we have a much lighter, more subtle texture. And obviously I don't want this green kind of toxic color, so, Let's just change that back to something a little bit more pink or magenta. And if I wanted to, I could even drag this into its own layer. So let's make a new layer, move that texture to it, and then put that on the very top. And now we have this nice little subtle, consistent texture over our entire image, and we can very easily modify its color. But that's how an opacity mask works inside of Illustrator. Now let's jump into Photoshop and talk about masking techniques inside of this program. Now let's just jump straight into opacity masks because they're very similar to the way that Illustrator handles them. So masking inside of Photoshop looks a little bit different in our layers palette is where we're gonna see our masks. So with this layer selected, I'm gonna come down to this mask icon right down here. It's a rectangle with a hole in it. If I click on that, it says add a mask. It's just going to add an empty mask, just like it did in Illustrator when we said make mask. Instead of making it pure black though, it made it pure white. Now you can see that I have these corners around my mask indicating that I'm editing the mask and not the layer. And I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger just by going up to my menu settings for the layers palette, going to panel options, and then making this nice and big, my thumbnail size, just so this is really easy to see. If I were to just grab my rectangular marquee tool and draw a rough rectangle around this cassette tape and then fill it with black, I'll just press Option or Alt on a PC plus Delete. That will fill my mask with black. You can see it right there. That makes it 100% transparent. So I'm gonna Command or Control D to deselect. And then with this still selected, I just wanna invert it so that the white becomes black, the black becomes white. Very simple command, just press Command or Control I on the keyboard and that will invert whatever you have selected. Now my mask is revealing the cassette tape and removing the background. Obviously, it's not doing a good job because that was a very rough selection, but that again is the basics of how layer masks work in Photoshop. It's exactly the same as opacity masks in Illustrator. Now the benefit of working with masks rather than just using the eraser tool is that this is completely non-destructive. You're editing a mask, not the original layer. So if I were to press shift and click on this thumbnail, I can still see all of the content that I'm masking out. I'm not deleting or losing any of that data. I can always get back to it. So if I were to enable this again and then switch to say my brush tool, and I just have a soft round brush, I'll make it a little bit bigger. 
you'll see that I'm gonna be painting with black, meaning I'm going to remove from my mask. Uh, I, I can paint off and say, oh, I accidentally cut off the corner of this cassette. Let me make a background color so this is a little easier to see. I'll just make it a nice bright yellowy orangey color and stick that in the background. Uh, so I cut off the corner of my cassette. Well, all I have to do to get that back is swap my two colors, my foreground and background colors, to be white so that I paint this back in, right? Now, uh, this is not a great example of painting a mask because this is a very clean shape, the cassette tape. So, you know, using a brush tool like this is gonna be very imprecise and it's just gonna be a lot of back and forth of just adding and then removing from the mask and it's never gonna look all that great. So that approach of using a brush tool to mask something out this rigid is just not something I would do. So let me just brush this back in so I have my whole cassette tape again. And let's zoom in to say this hole right here. This is something that we actually could use a selection tool. Um, this would be very useful for. If I go to my elliptical marquee tool, I could match that oval in here by clicking and dragging and then I'll hold the space bar to reposition the top left corner and kind of fit it to the hole of that cassette right about there. And then I'll fill that with black. So that's my background color currently. So instead of option deleting, I'm gonna command delete to fill with my background color. And again, I have this mask selected, so it is affecting the mask, not the content of that layer. If I hold down option or alt and click on that mask thumbnail, we can see that resulting mask in better detail. And it looks like I even missed a little bit of my mask here to fill back in with white. So I'll just switch to my brush tool and fill that in again. Then I'll press Option or Alt to get out of that while clicking on that thumbnail. And there we go, we now have that hole showing the transparency through there. That's a great use of that selection tool. But generally, these raster masks or layer masks are good for really fine details because Photoshop has an entire suite of tools for making really nice selections and masks of hard to mask things like people's hair or blades of grass things that have semi-transparent pixels that are see-through. Those kinds of masks need to be extremely precise and really clean, and Photoshop just has so many tools designed exactly for making those really tough selections. But there is another type of mask that you can work with inside of Photoshop called a vector mask. So if I click on that add mask button one more time, I'm gonna get a third little thumbnail here, and that is a vector mask. So I'm just gonna disable this layer mask by shift clicking on it, put an X through it, and I'm back to my original unmasked image. So I need to start drawing some vector paths. So I'm just gonna switch to the pen tool. So I'll press P on the keyboard, and then I'm gonna make sure that I'm drawing a path, not a shape, and start tracing this cassette tape. So I'm gonna just start right here, right where that little knob is, click once, then go up here, click and drag, and just start masking this out. Now, immediately, my image has disappeared. And that's because you can see that it is using this fill, the area of my vector path, to mask out this image. So just temporarily, I'm also going to disable the vector mask by holding shift and clicking on it so that I can still see my image. And then I'll make sure that I click one more time on it so I can see that vector path and keep working on it. So I'll just click right there on the end and continue masking. Now I'm gonna speed this up a little bit if you wanna learn how to use the pen tool, there are lots of resources online. It's also something that I cover inside of Photoshop and Illustrator Unleashed, so be sure to check that out if you're interested in learning more. But there we go, we have a very quick and rough mask, and I can re-enable this now by pressing Shift and clicking on that thumbnail, and this layer is now masked out. If I click off of the layer, you can see that it's nice and clean edges. Because it's a vector, I can go back into this path and readjust it, just like being able to adjust the layer mask. It's totally non-destructive. It allows us to work very freely without worrying about losing anything. Now, let's say that I wanna cut out this section right here. Well, if I have that path selected and I press P to get back to my pen tool and start cutting this out, again, I will speed this up so you don't have to watch me using the pen tool. Now that I've closed that path, you see that it has not cut out anything, and that's because it has the same path operation enabled, combine shapes. If I want that to punch a hole out, I need to set it to either subtract front shape or exclude overlapping shapes. So I'll just set it to subtract, so it's removing instead of adding. And now that I have that path, I can actually option or alt click and drag that over here and kind of line it up roughly, and then just kind of transform it by pressing Command T 
and that's very rough, but it kind of gets the job done. Now, obviously I could clean up those pads a little bit more, but that's how you can use both layer masks and vector masks to mask out objects inside of Photoshop. Hopefully that cleared things up for you and showed you just how powerful the masking tools are in Photoshop and Illustrator. Hit subscribe if you want more tips like this one and make sure to check the description so you can download the project files from this video. If you want to truly learn how to use these two apps with the help of industry pros and fun example projects, check out Photoshop and Illustrator Unleashed from School of Motion. Thanks for watching.